Good morning. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for uh, inviting me this morning. I want to open up with a caveat, and that is to have an American speak to a bunch of Europeans about uh, CSR seems a bit odd. <laughs> My colleague Ludo Bommens, who is uh, not an American, who is from here, from here in Belgium, see, promised me that I would not have rotten eggs thrown at me. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that. We've been very honored to be part of CSR Europe. Uh, we've learned a lot from uh, the folks in this room. In fact, uh, the report that was suggested, I've, I'm holding up a copy. I normally would not be, bring a prop, but the purpose of this prop is to advertise CSR Europe because uh, folks here helped us develop this report. Uh, you are a critical stakeholder as we figured out how to do this. You all have been doing this for a while. We're new to it. So uh, thank you for your help on that, and thank you for your leadership in CSR Europe. Um, let me take a few minutes and describe what we do at KKR, uh, how that model has evolved, and then how we build into our processes considerations of environmental, social, and governance issues, and as the report indicates, how we believe doing this creates sustainable value, which is the topic for this morning. First, KKR just celebrated our 35th anniversary. We were founded in 1976. As was noted, uh, we are one of the first firms that is in the buyout business. We started that year when uh, our founders, who still run the firm, uh, came up with an insight. And the insight was that there are a lot of companies in the world that weren't as efficient and that weren't as effective as they could be because those companies had managers that thought of themselves as agents. The managers were paid well whether the company did well or not well. The managers didn't take the responsibility that the people in this room take, and they had an insight of one way, not the only way, but one way to improve that was to figure out how to better tie the management compensation to the way that owners are compensated, which is what does the company do in, fifth, in the fifth year or sixth year? How does it grow over the long term? And they built a business around that. And the business they built uh, took capital from investors, mostly institutional investors, a lot of European institutional investors, along with the capital of people in our firm, pulled it together, bought companies, took controlling investments in those companies. The acquisitions were all friendly. They were all desired. And the goal was, over a period of not months, but years, typically seven years is our holding period, to make the company worth more, to make the company grow, to make the company's value enhance, to make the company better, bigger, more effective. And in building that model, the approach we've always tried to take is one that said, anybody can give you capital, but what else can we bring to the table? What other opportunities, what other expertise, what other solutions can we provide to companies? In the beginning, as I noted, one thing we brought to the table was the concept that management and boards that were rewarded the same way owners were rewarded would be good for companies and would be good for the growth of those companies. About 10 years ago, we built out our own internal operations group, an operations consulting group. A lot of folks who used to work at the McKinsey's and the Bain Consultings and the BCG's, and all they do is focus on our companies because operational improvement and efficiency was, we thought, critical to companies. About four years ago, we built our business out globally because today the ability to go global is something companies need solutions to. And so our offices in China or India help companies in Europe and vice versa to grow. But today I want to address another thing that companies need help on and it's an area we spend a lot of time thinking about and focusing on and where CSR Europe has taken a real lead. And that is today companies must address what I call the legitimacy question. They must address a question that you all have spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about. There are a lot of reasons for it. Some of them are laid out in the materials. And our thinking on this has been improved by your own thinking on the question. But think about it. One, over the last decade, we have seen example after example where the externalities of capitalism produce bad results. Whether it was the financial crisis, whether it was the BP oil spill in the United States, there are lots of examples where it seemed like business was not sufficiently attentive to the externalities of its operations. Second, transparency. The effect of the internet means that we're all in a fishbowl. Everything we do every day 
is viewed by everybody. And that transparency also can create, if you're not sufficiently attentive, a crisis of legitimacy. Third, globalization. If you're doing business all over the world, if you're sourcing in places that you never did before, you have questions you have to answer. You have challenges. You have issues to deal with. Resource scarcity is another one. All of these factors today mean that smart companies that are not just thinking about efficiency and not just thinking about optimizing their capital structures, they're thinking about how do they ensure legitimacy with their customers, with their consumers, with their regulators, and with the places where they operate. And it seems to me that when we looked at this, when we thought about this, there are really three choices. One, you can ignore the problem until you've got a real crisis on your hands. It'll go away. We're just going to focus on bottom line. It's not really an issue. Companies we've seen do that, they're always disappointed. Second, you can complain about it. You can whine. You can say this is unfair. Doesn't do a lot of good. Or third, what you can do is you can be much more proactive and try to take a win-win approach. And let me describe to you how we try to do that. The approach we try to take, which is listed in our material, what our ultimate KPI is, is how do we build these considerations into our investment and our portfolio management processes? We today own about 64 companies around the world. Uh, either directly own them or have essentially majority investments, influencing investments in those companies. On the board, real influence on the operations. And we, as we make investments in the future, today and in the past several years, part of the investment diligence process includes careful consideration of ESG factors. We look each year at literally thousands of companies. We take seriously dozens of companies. In a big year, we maybe make 10 investments. And Part of that investment diligence we do today is very careful consideration of ESG factors. What are the changing regulations and regulatory systems likely to affect that company? What is its environmental footprint? What is its relationship with key communities in which it operates? Has it handled sourcing? What are its anti-corruption policies? How does it do when it comes to transparency? All of these are questions we ask, and there are others too, depending on the nature of the company. But these are questions that are considered by an investment committee comprised of our most senior people. The average person on our investment committee at KKR has more than 20 years of investment experience. And today, their consideration, informed by people like Ludo and myself, includes careful analysis of every one of these factors to determine, do we want to be associated with this company, and is there an opportunity for value creation? Let me give you an example of an investment we had in 2009. We bought a company in South Korea called Oriental Brewery from InBev. Uh, Korean beer is more delicious since we bought the company, from my perspective. <laughs> but we bought this company, and there were two things that, as part of our diligence, we determined, or three things. First, we knew that the history of Americans investing in South Korea was not an entirely happy one. And we thought it was very important early in the process to make sure that all key constituencies understood that we were not intending to come in and just make a bunch of money, but we were intended to be good citizens, committed to the country, committed to investing, not just in one company, but over a long term. Second, our diligence informed us and convinced us that significant energy savings and thus significant greenhouse gas emissions could be improved and energy savings could be achieved if we use less energy in the beer production and less water in the beer production. Given that our target demographic for that company's customers is 18 to 29-year-olds, that was an audience we thought that would also like that, providing an additional benefit from a consumer and marketing perspective. And third, this was an industry and a company that had a very active, very aggressive union. And so reaching out early in the process to that union became critical. Every one of these factors was identified as part of our diligence. And every one of these factors, when we decided to buy the company, became part of our plan for how we would run the company. That's an example. That's done for every company we invest in today. It's a careful part of the process, and it's a critical part of the process. Secondly is the stewardship process, the ownership process. We own these companies for an average of seven years. And during the course of that process, our goal is to build in these ESG considerations we've identified and make it part of how we manage companies and also how our portfolio companies can share information. Let me give you some examples. First, 
Part of what we've learned over 35 years is it is absolutely critical when you walk in a company. One of our founders always says, don't congratulate us when we buy a company. Any fool can pay too much for a company. What makes a difference is what do you do with the company? And so when day one, when we walk in, we have something called a 100 day planning model. Day one, we have a plan for the first 100 days of the company, followed by the next 100 days of the company, followed by the next 100 days of the company, to make sure that whatever the investment thesis was, whatever the theory we had when we bought it, of how the company could be improved, gets enacted and gets executed. And so today, that 100-day planning process includes consideration of these ESG questions and how we can improve operationally these issues. Second, we have a regular process of portfolio management. All of our companies report to us on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, and a yearly basis on key metrics, key operational metrics, key financial metrics, key metrics identified against the investment thesis. And today, those metrics include environmental, governance, social issues that are relevant. And third, because we own 64 companies, including big companies, Alliance Boots is one of the companies in which we are invested. Tarquette is one of the companies in which we're invested. Prozeban is one of the companies in which we're invested. These are smart companies, sophisticated companies who have thought about these questions. And so we can learn from them and they can learn from each other. And let me give you three examples, an E, an S, and a G, of programs we've put in place to share best practices along these lines. First, the E. We have a partnership with a global NGO called the Environmental Defense Fund. That company operates today at 17 KKR companies. It'll be at 24 companies by the end of this year. And the thesis of this partnership is one that in Europe you understand well, we understand somewhat well in America, and we're learning it even better, folks are learning it even better in Asia, and that is pollution is expensive. Reduce pollution, save money. So we focus on identifying what we call KIPAs, key environmental performance areas around energy use, water use, the use of forest products, waste generation, and the use of chemicals to identify ways to save money and reduce the environmental footprint. Some examples. Anyone here sleep on a Sealy mattress? Ever heard of a Sealy mattress? One per, two people, four, three people, four people. We own that company. Sealy delivers a lot of mattresses, as you can imagine. We've developed a fleet management approach that says, let's load up all the trucks before you deliver. Let's route them more carefully so you're not going in the same neighborhood or the same community two days in a row. Let's teach drivers not to idle. Let's make sure that we drive more slowly. That effort, which now applies not just at Sealy, but other companies we own that have fleets, saved tens of millions of dollars and tens of thousands of metric tons of CO2 emissions. We own a company called Dollar General. It's a retailer. Like a lot of retailers, they receive their products in cardboard containers. They used to pay people to haul the cardboard away. They now recycle it. The result of that is tens of millions of dollars of savings, significant improvement in environmental footprint. We own SunGuard, a company that makes software. We've developed systems with respect to SunGuard that change the temperature in data centers based on what's happening in those data centers and that generally optimize the use of green technology. Any data company we ever buy will now be able to, based on those learnings and those findings, apply to, and again, that produces results. In one year, at eight of the 16 companies where we have results, we saved $160 million, 345,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions, the equivalent, I'm going to show myself to be a New Yorker now, the equivalent in trees of twice the trees in Central Park, all saved because of this program we put in place, all measured on a regular basis, all now a permanent part of how we do operations. Another E we have is a green technology group that on a monthly basis brings in the chief technology officers and discusses best practices for how to use technology better to improve environmental footprint. Our S. Our S is a partnership with a group called Business for Social Responsibility. Some folks here may be part of that organization. And the S is based on a challenge many of you may face too, and that is sourcing. We've seen a lot of companies that source out of China, that source out of other nations, who thought they were doing a fine job who audited their factories, and then they find out they have problems, they have issues. So we developed a protocol, a training session, and a self-diagnostic to allow our companies to 
determine, are they doing a good job? Who are the best auditors? How do they audit the facilities? And how do they make sure that the factories they're using operate in a way in which they'd be proud and in which they'd be comfortable? That's also an effort that we have going forward. And finally, on the G, and there are other programs too, but, but I also know the time is, 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 is careful. Um, we have an effort around anti-corruption where we've gone through every one of our 50, 64 companies around the world. We've audited their anti-corruption policies and determined where improvement needs to be made. We have efforts with respect to transparency. We are uh, training our companies uh, globally on what are our best practices around transparency. How do they do a better job of communicating? And how do we learn so that next year's report is even better than this past one? In every one of those areas and others as well, our effort is a portfolio-wide approach that shares best practices, where best practices are built into operations, not a separate sidecar, not a PR operation, but operations, how our companies operate, and where we have an excellent NGO working with us, example, CSR Europe, which is helping us in a number of companies. We also look for smart external advisors. I see that KPMG is here today. They're an incredibly important advisor to us on these questions and have been incredibly helpful to us in thinking about our own environmental footprint at KKR and helping our companies take it to the next level. And we thank you for your help and for your leadership when it comes to that. So all of these are examples of how this is built into the um, stewardship process, the portfolio management process. And what's exciting to us is when you do it at one company, there's learnings that can work at 63 other companies. And by the way, when you do it at one company that is an Alliance Boots, the impact of that on the industry generally is significant. So we are excited because we think that the impact can be both within our portfolio, 64 companies, 900,000 people that work at those companies. And then, because many of those companies are leaders in their respective sectors, which can apply across the sector, we think there's a real opportunity to leverage this and build this and enhance this. Two other points. One, critical to this has been internal training and building out internal expertise. This is part of every training session we do at every firm meeting. It's part of new employee orientation. It's part of setting up cross-portfolio sessions. We have a session in New York Monday night and Tuesday with all of our general counsels and our chief regulatory officers. We have a session in about a week with all of our chief information officers in uh, Wiesbaden. We have a session later in the year with our chief uh, HR people. We have a session even later in the year with our CFOs of all of our companies. At every one of those sessions, this is an issue is addressed, and we discuss best practices and how we can learn from one another, and that's critical. Two final points. One, the approach we try to take, and this is really important, is what I call real sustainability or shared value. Um, you know, it's easy to just say, okay, we're going to do this, but it's not financially sustainable. Our goal is to put in place policies that even if there's a downturn, remain in place, and to put in policies that, by the way, are in place after we exit the investment, after we're out of the company. And that only happens if there's shared value, if there are efforts that are financially sensible and also from an environmental, social, or governance perspective sensible. Final point is this. As good investors, people pay us to manage risk at the end of the day. That's what they pay us for. Get good reward, mitigate risk in the investments you make. You cannot do this today if you don't understand the regulatory issues in the companies in which you invest. You cannot do this today if you're not addressing stakeholder concerns. You cannot do this today if you're saying, okay, that's labor stuff. I'll figure it out down the road. I'm not really sure what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out. Or I'm not thinking about how much water I used. If you're doing those things and not taking them seriously, you will be surprised. Your returns will be less. It's not just the wrong thing to do from a societal perspective. It's a dumb thing to do as an investor, and our goal is to avoid doing that, and that's critical. Second, good investors in our case involve alignment of interests. Our companies are successful because if the management of the company and the board of the company and we at KKR and the institutional investors are all paid the same way, they're all paid what the company's worth in year seven, and you measure success not in quarters or days, but in years and months, in years, not months, you're going to produce a much better result. And this is consistent with that alignment of interest. You can't say you've got an alignment of interest if your workers hate coming, or the communities where you're operating view you as illegitimate, or you're overusing resources. That's not alignment either. And finally, our success is predicated on thinking long term, which is just critical too. So it is an honor to be with you today. 
We appreciate all that we've learned and will continue to learn from CSR Europe. Appreciate your hearing from an American. Um, I hope I haven't embarrassed my country or myself. Um, but uh, we really think this is critical. It's a critical part of what we do. It's a critical part of our DNA. We're just learning. We're still new to the process. We're nowhere near like Belgacom, which is way advanced. But we look forward to learning from some of the things you're doing. Thank you for including me this morning. And my colleague, Ludo Bamans, you'll hear from throughout the day as well. So thank you.